Hey everybody, welcome to Cooks Who Cares Beyond the Table, a project where we are connecting you to people behind the scenes making incredible food, leading people, and really trying to get themselves in their hurdle along the day. Um, it's important for us to share stories about creators, makers, leaders, to really give you this idea that um, they're reachable people. They have real feelings, they do things that are challenging, they have struggles, and um, it's hard because it's often so easy to see just all the really great stuff, and the journey is what is the most important part. So I hope you enjoy what we have brought you here today at this beautiful location, and um, enjoy the show. I'm Stephanie Angstadt and I am the owner and cheesemaker of Valley Milk House Creamery in the Ole Valley of Berks County. Uh, we're making primarily French and European styles of cheeses, so some fresh and some soft ripened styles, as well as some aged varieties. Um, and we are a small two-person operation, uh, making about 12,000 pounds of cheese per year. We uh, distribute throughout Philadelphia and the Lehigh Valley region. Um, some of the main uh, wholesale accounts that we work with are Fair Food, Tria, the Weaver's Way Co-ops, um, the Tallulah's establishments, and uh, lots of others throughout the region. We're very lucky to have such a strong demand for artisan cheese. Uh, our situation is in Berks County, so we're kind of tucked away. We're um, north of Chester County and west of the Lehigh Valley. Um, in a very rural area, sort of a bread basket of some nearby cities. Uh, there are lots of farms in the area, um, including many up-and-coming organic veggie farms and um, bread bakers, cheese makers, and the works. Uh, I started the operation three years ago, and uh, happy to be on the show. I started as a home cheesemaker really out of a love of cheese and I grew up with a Belgian mother, spent a lot of time in Europe growing up, fell in love with all the stinky cheeses in the shop, that sort of thing, um, and have always loved cheese. Uh, when I was living in New York, I had a friend who was a home beer brewer and so I got interested in fermentation that way. And you know, the sort of, I was led down the path of home cheese making through that. Picked up a kit and a book and just started with some milk and some rennet. Um, and I, I liked it. And the more that I uh, read about cheese making and more, more specifically cheese makers and that sort of lifestyle, I was really drawn to it. Um, and I think a lot of people have romantic ideas about um, being situated kind of between the farm and the kitchen and yeah. being so tied to agriculture um, without necessarily being a farmer, uh, which was of interest to me. Home cheese making, was working a corporate job in New York City, okay. sort of a nine to five. Uh, I was working for um, a financial services company uh, doing sales stuff. And uh, I guess after about three years, I decided that um, I wasn't very passionate about it. And this is the, like the story that everyone has. I, I just wasn't passionate about it. Um, and instead of doing nothing about it, I decided to just pick up and leave and do something about it. <laughs> so I, um, I moved out to Colorado and I worked for a goat dairy out there making cheese and wanted to see what it was all about for real. Um, so on a more commercial leap. scale. So I made the leap. Reality was, was for me pretty close to that fantasy that I had. Mm -hmm. You know, she's making is such a sensual experience and um, you know, you're creating something with your hands that 
I think it's really the most refined agricultural product that exists in the world. Yeah. Um, so it was, yeah, I, I liked I liked every aspect of it, and I don't even mind doing dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not interested in national distribution. I'm not interested in winning awards. Um, I'm interested in doing meaningful work that I care about. That's all. It, I just I derive fulfillment from my day-to-day -day existence. Live in an awesome community. Um, that is enough. You know, like not not about setting the bar low, but just about like having real expectations and. Um, you know, at some point we just have to do something and then put our full faith behind it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an unromantic way of looking at it, but we have to do something with our hours and our days. And yeah, it, this is, I'm just very lucky that I found something that actually is, you know, is meaningful to me. So. Yeah, that's cool. Kind of tell me a little bit about the steps into this becoming home essentially for your business and your your personal home yeah absolutely um the, the funny story of how i ended up back here so my father grew up in this area and his siblings are all around so have lots of family in the area um and i only spent childhood years here um and then ended up moving to new jersey and then school in rhode island and lived in new york and lived in colorado have moved all around and have also traveled a lot internationally in different segments of my life. Um, so I, it's a, always a long answer when people ask where I'm from, because I'm from all over. Um, I uh, ended up back in Berks County um, because of an ancestral connection that I have to the area. Um, so my last name is Angstadt, and there are a bunch of Angstads roaming around these parts. And uh, <laughs> it's really funny. I don't have to tell anyone how to spell my last name. It's amazing. Um, and uh, the way I got connected back to it was um, through a farmer who I met at the Union Square Green Market in New York. And I was looking for a place to settle down after Colorado and after some international travel. And I met this gentleman, Tim Stark, of Eckerton Hill Farm, um, who uh, at the time wasn't hiring. I was looking for a farm job wasn't hiring but um but we got to talking anyway and when he found out who i was i introduced myself when he found out my last name his jaw just dropped and he said oh well i own the original angstadt homestead i have a 58 acre farm in berks county that was owned for 300 years by the angstadt family um which are my direct ancestors because only the one guy came over from germany so um we, it was just this serendipitous wow. moment. It was pretty cool. And sure enough, he was like, well, maybe I do have to hire you. So we, ca I came out for a visit and um, he was looking, yeah, he, he carved out a role for me. You know, he was like, maybe we should start a CSA. And I helped him start a CSA and did farm work there. But that's how I got reintroduced to the area. And it was, it was very fateful because I could have easily ended up somewhere else. Now, once I was reintroduced to the area as a young adult, um, I fell back in love with it and really found a tight-knit community here of farmers and artisans who are the same thing, just seeking out really meaningful work. And um, there's a distance between us because it is very rural, uh, like a geographic distance, but it's, it's a really, it's a nice community and beautiful landscape. And I think one of the things that's so nice is that we're two hours from New York and an hour from Philly. So we have access to great markets and it's a, it's a good place to be if you're producing food or anything off of the land. The first two years of the operation were about really um, honing in on the varieties that I want to be producing. So it was about selection. You know, it was about casting the net wide, trying a lot of different styles and then finding which ones are uh, which ones do I enjoy eating, which ones do I enjoy making, and what's the, the market need. Um, and it happened to be that they all aligned with the, the bloomy rind style. So fresh and soft ripened cheeses that are primarily French styles. Those are the ones I 
love to eat and uh, and they're really fascinating to make to watch the rinds bloom like that they're, they're such a physical transformation um, and then we talked about this controlled decay you know it's like once the rind blooms then it starts ripening the cheese from the outside in and so that process is really fascinating too What would you do, this is three years now into your business, mm -hmm. if Stephanie, starting, came to you, Stephanie, <laughs> three years later, what would you tell her trying to approach this idea? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good question. <sighs> Pace yourself. I wish I had paced myself a little more when I started. I think I was just so excited and I wanted to be everything to everybody and um, I, I took on too much and I think, um, yeah, just stretched myself too thin, you know, got, instead of making five cheeses that I really love and want to do really well at, I, you know, I made 12 and kind of didn't take the time to really observe and learn about each one. Uh, there was a lot of uh, wholesale demand right off the bat. Not, I wish I had pumped the brakes on that because I, I wasn't quite ready, you know? I hadn't refined the products the way that I wanted to. And, um, and you know, people will wait. And if they can't have something, they want it even more, you know? So you don't even have to feel like that, you know, Meeting the, meeting the need is, is um, such a time sensitive thing. Uh, yeah, I, I think just, just taking your time and, and really being so focused on the process that that's the primary, um, that that's the primary driver. Yeah, sort of that inward looking um, you know, perspective is more important than all the stuff that happens around you, I think sometimes, especially starting off.